Of off the menu, I'm Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House here with the Charles Coulomb. Do you have anything to say uh, before we get started today? Well, I do actually. I've got several things to say. One is it dawned on me earlier this week. This is we are living at this moment in this all too hot summer, the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love. Wow. Yeah. This was when Scott McKenzie advised everyone to, if they were coming to San Francisco to wear flowers in their hair. This was the summer that the Immaculate Heart nuns who taught me were busy having their minds rotted by Carl Rogers. This was the summer I learned to read between my first and second grades. It was the summer of 67, 50 years ago. How is that possible? Time flies. You're not kidding. Boy, if I had known then what I know now, I would never have grown up. Some say I haven't yet. I don't know. It's pretty sad. But at any rate, uh, so that's one thing. The other thing, which is apropos of absolutely nothing, although I'm still wandering around the past, I guess, uh, I saw something really bizarre with a friend of mine on the on video yesterday. You know, everything is still alive out there floating on the internet. Uh-huh. Neither of us had seen this broadcast since 1976. It was the Paul Lind Halloween special. Okay. I have not, I had forgotten how truly off the wall it was, but I remember watching it back then and thinking, this is really strange. It hasn't gotten less strange with the passage of time. It's on YouTube? Oh, yeah. Look it up, the Paul Lind Halloween special. Uh, Paul Lind, Kiss... Florence Henderson, uh, Jim Godway, Dottie and Marie Osmond, Margaret Hamilton, The Wicked Witch of the West, Witchy Poo, if you're a H.R. Puffin stuff fan, all of them together under one roof. And Billy Barney. Can't forget Billy Barney. So the little big man, as we call him. So, no, it's, if you really want to have the insides of your head scooped out and, you know, kind of turn into, like, devil egg, there you, you just go. give it a watch. <laughs> There it'll be. Okay. <laughs> so we've done a whole year of shows, but we haven't yet touched upon uh, personal questions about you. Oh, jeez. And based on the questions we're starting to receive, it's clear that people would like to know more about you. I do know all about me. So we've, we've got a bunch of questions on your likes, dislikes, personal preferences, uh, stuff like that. But before we get to those questions, I have a couple questions for you. Oh, boy. Okay. But yeah. Uh, people on the internet have called you a lot of different things. <laughs> now, can you say these uh, in a family audience? I, yeah, yeah, I okay. think so. All yeah. right. Uh, perennialist, occultist, Gnostic, and my personal favorite, crypto hippie. Crypto hippie? Well, you know, I'm wearing a paisley tie in honor of the summer of love, so maybe there's some truth to that last one. Well... Let's take them one by one, shall we? Okay. Now, mind you, ladies and gentlemen, one of the big problems of our time are people using big words and not knowing what they mean. From top, the very top of society, in church and state, down to the bottom, you've got all kinds of people using big words as insults, and they don't know what they mean. They end up looking stupid. If you're going to insult someone, be sure you know what the word means. Or the person you're trying to insult will just laugh at you and tell his friends that they'll laugh. I think this is the image of the 21st century. You know what this is? A huge mouth with a tiny little brain stem. The little brain stem governs the involuntary functions. It can breathe and stuff while it sleeps. But other than that, the mouth just keeps yapping. So, with that understood, let's take these words one by one. Oh. What's the first one? Perennialist. Okay. Now, that can have a lot of meanings. You know, a perennial is something that grows constantly, like tulips. Uh, and I don't think I'm being accused of being a tulip. In this particular case, I suspect what they mean is a follower of a very annoying individual called René Guénon. There's a name for you people who like perennialism, René Guénon. Uh, he was a Frenchman, as you might guess from the name. 
and uh, an individual who did something that I really loathe. He started out as Catholic and he ended as Muslim. Wow. Yeah, Sufi. Um, so calling me a perennialist is kind of annoying, but let me explain a little bit about perennialism, and I'll see where I think I think I know where they're getting at. Not that they think I'm a Sufi. Oh, okay. Or I don't think that's it. Or that they think I'm kind of weasel looking, because Renee again all looks a little like a weasel if you see his pictures. Wow. Um, you know, it happens. You know, people can't help how they look. Okay. I can't help these jowls. You know. That's okay. Anyway, um, no, the the perennialist believes that there is an underlying tradition, a religious tradition, that is to be found more or less in every religious tradition of man. And that it's purer and more closer to the source in some than in others. Dan Hawk came to the came to the conclusion that it was purest and truest in Sufi Islam. Now that I utterly reject. But I will say that it is looking at the whole thing from the wrong end of the telescope. How is that? Well, obviously there was a, uh, an original revelation given by uh, God to our first parents. And obviously it survived in a more or less corrupt form amongst the various peoples of uh, the earth. Uh. But in a pure form only among the Jews. Uh, you know, the, we've, we've uh, heard of the covenant with Noah and the covenant with Abraham, right? Well, remnants and bits and pieces of this original religion are found in places you wouldn't expect. So, for instance, uh, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, is called a priest of the high God. Well, he wasn't a Jewish priest. What was he a priest of? At Ditto Melchizedek, there was an antique religion predating Judaism from which Judaism came and of which was the purest exponent. More than that, I can't say, and I don't think anybody else knows either. Okay. But uh, bits and pieces of it have survived here and there, so you'll see them, like the Trinitarian nature of the Godhead in Hinduism, or the three dominant gods in Greek and Norse mythology. And there are other, th other things that survive from that. Uh, uh, the idea of a god that dies and rises again, the god born of a virgin. These things are scattered throughout the religions of mankind. Whether or not they're survivors of that original revelation, or simply because, as Tertullian says, the soul is naturally Christian, um, the, and so they're sort of embedded in our mental DNA, so to speak. Which or either or both of those, is, I, I don't know. However, where the perennialist would see these things as ends of themselves, for the Catholic and so for me, to the degree that they have any value, it is as a preparatio evangelium, a preparation for the gospel. Okay. That is to say, something that missionaries, when they are attempting to bring a people to the true church, the true faith, can build upon. Rather like St. Paul talking about the unknown God in Athens. I see. It's that kind of thing. Uh, so, if by perennialist you mean a follower of René Guénon, or the believer that all the religions of mankind are salvific, no. If by that you mean a uh, believer that uh, once upon a time there was a common religion to all mankind, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but that religion uh, is only true and pure and preserved in its fullness in the Catholic Church, outside of which uh, it is not salvific. So that's the perennialist. What's your next one? A cultist. Woo! Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got to compose myself. All right. Well, first we've got to ask ourselves what an occultist is. Uh, it's kind of like when people talk about Kabbalah. What does it mean? It's a big word. I presume what, and again, I'm presuming like the person who uses the word presumes. So if by a cultist he means someone who likes cheese, then I'm wrong. No, I don't know. I don't know what he means by it. But I presume he means someone who traffics with Satan 
for supernatural or to be more exact preternatural power absolutely not that's not you no sadly oh, okay if it were, do you think we'd be sitting in a studio <laughs> like this? Let me tell you something. We'd be on the, t the front page of Time magazine. So, wolf in sheep's clothing, you are. Or a sheep in wolf's clothing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my, my problem is always, uh, our Lord told us to be as wise as uh, serpents and innocent as doves. I'm afraid I'm as innocent as a serpent and as wise as a dove. But at any rate, I digress. So, the, you know, the thing is that... Uh, uh, an occultist is one who, uh, depending upon uh, upon who is defining it, either traffics with the dark powers or theorizes thereabout. Now again, occult means secret. And so, uh, an occultist can mean all kinds of things. Uh, if they mean ceremonial magicians, well then that's, and you're brought to the question of what is magic? Uh, the medieval, as we've discussed before, the medieval definition was the accomplishment of uh, means out of, or the accomplishment of ends out of all promotion, proportion of the means used. Uh, if that is magic, I can tell you I'm no magician. What I will admit does interest me, and here I will stand guilty as, as uh, charged, was the philosophical theorizing behind the occult revival of the 19th century. Okay. Now, I will explain. Okay. In the wake of the French Revolution, the Age of Reason and so forth, which was so bloody-minded because it was so reasonable, um, you had what was called the Romantic Revival. And from that came all sorts of things, from the Anglo-Catholic movement to Victor Hugo, to uh, the rise in occult, not occult, but uh, uh, Gothic and uh, horror literature. That all came out of the French Revolution, well, not of the French Revolution, but Romanticism, and partly as a uh, response also to the Industrial Revolution and to the growth of materialism. You see, nothing happens in a vacuum. As materialism grew, secularism grew, uh, a lot of thinkers pursued different avenues in response. And some of these were what are called by the historians the occult revival of the 19th century. In France, these people mostly tried to stay Catholic. In England, they generally hadn't been, so they didn't bother. And I certainly have studied all these guys, you betcha. Why? Because of the philosophy that they employed. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of lost. What, 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 what's the occult part of the occult right, revival? I well, the occult part was that some of them attempted to practice magic and oh. revive the Renaissance ideas of magic from people like Pico della Mirandola and uh, Agrippa and all kinds of other guys you've never heard of. Okay. But what basically was that philosophy? Well, it was the idea that what we see on earth reflects what's in heaven. The idea that words have power and can accomplish things. That, of course, you might have guessed is magic, but it's also the sacraments. And so, I, and just in case you get excited, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying that the sacraments are black magic or voodoo. Drawing of distinctions is very important here. Because if you don't draw distinctions, you'll get messed up. Not that that's a bad thing to be, I don't want to judge. The thing is that as Catholics, we know that when the priest says a few words in the right way, with the right intention, or with the right stuff, God comes to earth, the individual is cured of his sins, the individual is incorporated in the mystical body of Christ, the Holy Ghost comes to him, depending on the sacrament. Yeah. Two souls are joined as one. The apostolic succession is passed on. But these are actions, these are goals, ends out of all proportion to the means used. They make no sense from the human point of view. We know they're true because of revelation. We can never come to them on our own. The 19th century occult revival involved looking at those principles and seeing if they applied to everything else. 
And so I can't say it was inspired by the sacraments and certainly not vice versa. But I can't say it was a cognate philosophy derived from Neoplatonism. And so it is their worldview that's always interested in them, not the practice of magic. Would you see the distinction? Okay, the worldview, not the, okay. That there is magic in the world. There, there are. You can say words, and then something preternatural or supernatural will happen. Yeah. Okay. I don't recommend you doing it, right. and I certainly would not and never have. Okay. So, for all you occultists out there, the other thing to bear in mind is that the occultists of the nineteenth and twentieth centuries, at least the not the ones who weren't uh, Aleister Crowley type would be Satanists we're looking in the midst of a world that had gotten completely materialistic for a direct connection to the divine. Mm -hmm. That was basically the end of that kind of ceremonial magic. Um, what they were trying to get at, of course, could much more easily, truthfully, safely be done by receiving the sacraments piously. But for various reasons, uh, especially in England, where the church was uh, a little thin on the ground, uh, a lot of these folk just did not avail themselves of it. But you look at people like William Butler Yeats, or like Charles Williams, Arthur Mackin, who initially dabbled in this sort of thing. It set them off, uh, not Yeats so much, but certainly Williams and Mackin, into a much more Christian direction that it ever could have done had they stayed the evangelical Protestants that were raised. And that's the thing, this kind of thing, if you could put yourself in the mindset of a 19th century evangelical Protestant, the sacraments were completely beyond them. Yeah. But the concepts that they acquired in studying magic allowed them to understand the sacraments in a way they simply couldn't have before. In a way, okay, I see. Because, you know, as far as they were concerned, the churches they were raised in, baptism and uh, communion were just symbols that had no inherent power. What they didn't realize was that the religions they were raised with were, were themselves, in this sense, very materialistic. Okay. But, okay, so just to be clear, you're not saying that's a good, in a sense, that occultism was there so Protestants could learn about this through that. Well, let's put it this way. It's kind of like um, Anglo-Catholicism or anything else that leads someone to the church. Uh, many people come to the faith through unpleasant means. You know, your wife dies and so you, it forces you to re-examine your life and so you come into the church. Does that mean your wife dying was a good thing? Well, I, <laughs> I wouldn't say the death of one's wife is an inherently good thing. No, I couldn't say that. Right. What I could say is that it had a beneficial effect, but it could have gone the other way. It's true. You could have completely despaired of anything and, you know, jumped off a bridge. So, this is why what you say, was it good, was it bad? Yeah. I see. Let me see how the guy ended up and then I'll tell you. I see. But I certainly would not recommend the uh, practice or study of magic uh, for people. Okay. And I, I will say, though, that this very issue got me in trouble writing for a magazine years ago. Oh, yes. And the thing was, people got upset with me, oh, you're a Satanist, you're an occultist, you're this, you're that. But, you know, I got a postcard one day from a lady in North Carolina thanking me for the very first article I wrote for Gnosis Magazine because she said it began on a road to the conversion. And, you know what, to me, that one postcard is worth all the grief I've gotten all these years over this stuff. And I would ask those who are very concerned about my occultism and so forth, or perennialism or the other words we're going to look into, if a tenth of the energy you put on denouncing me for those things, you put into evangelizing and bringing another soul to Christ, try that and then come back. Okay. Not that I'm bitter. Well, next word is Gnostic. Woo! Clearly because you wrote for Gnosis. You know, that, now that is a fair question for that very reason. Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, we have to know what Gnosis is. Because Gnostic comes from Gnosis. Gnosis means wisdom, knowledge. Agnosis, as an agnostic, means not knowing. <laughs> okay. 
So Gnostic is a term that can mean a lot of different things depending on who you're talking to. You could say that anyone who isn't an agnostic claims to be a Gnostic because he thinks he knows something. Okay. And the truth of the matter is that that phrase is almost like Protestant in the sense that it's used to, to cover so many things it almost means nothing. But historically, uh, it's a term that predates Christianity. The idea was that there was a knowledge, uh, possession of which was necessary for salvation to the individual. But what precisely was that knowledge? And therein lies all the difference. There was, um, now there were pagan Gnostics predating Christianity. There were Christian Gnostics, Jewish Gnostics. What did they all claim? They all claimed that they had this knowledge which was necessary for salvation. But it varied depending upon whom you were speaking to. So you had one set, uh, and we call those folks dualists. Not dualists as in fighting a duel, but dual as in two. Mm -hmm. And these dualists believed that there were two gods, equal strength in creation, the god of good and the god of evil. These are the dualists. The Zoroastrians are, okay. are, you know, believe this, the Manichaeans, people like that. Anyway. So the dualists then, some of them, not all, uh, and unfortunately, unless I mention a specific group, everything I'm going to be saying about Gnosticism does not cover everyone who either call themselves or were called Gnostic. Okay. Just so you know. But dualists, as I say, believe in these two equal gods. Now for many, but not all dualists, the good god created spirit, and the evil god matter. Ah, uh, I see. Now... In this particular mythos, human souls were trapped by the evil god of matter and imprisoned in the bodies we run around in. And if this sounds a lot like Scientology, nothing is new under the sun. But, let's move along. Some of these took it a step further, and they made the creator of the Old Testament into an evil god the so-called Demiurge. Well, once they did that, you can imagine how they reversed everything. Because if the God of the Old Testament was really evil, then his opponent, Satan, the bringer of knowledge, remember in the garden? Mm -hmm. He was good. Uh, you see what happens when you go crazy? Yeah. Yeah. And from that came all sorts of groups, a few of which are still around today, like the Yazidis in Iraq, that the Muslims have so much fun uh, oppressing and torturing now. No, I don't think Yazidis should be oppressed or tortured, but I'm mentioning that they do this. Um, this idea, this dualism, came into the West through the Manichaeans. You've heard of the Cathars, yeah? Yes. They, were, they, they held this kind of dualism. And this is why they were so hated by both church and state. Uh, the Cathars, interestingly enough, took it a step further in that because matter is inherently evil, we're unable to control our appetites. But, big but, if you procreate, you would trap another human being in the flesh. So procreation is evil. Sex you can't help, but procreation is evil. And what happens from that? Anything becomes good. Any kind of sex is permissible except that which leads to birth. Wow. Does that sound familiar too? Sounds like the United States. Yes, doesn't it just? But having said all of that, these people call themselves Gnostics. But there was another set, St. Clement of Alexandria. He called Gnostic anyone who held the true and Catholic faith, which he claimed, was the saving knowledge which leads to salvation. And, having said everything I've said, if you define Gnostic as St. Clement of Alexandria did, then I am a Gnostic. If you define it in any other way, I am not. You're complicating things too much. Why can't we just say you do some things that vaguely resemble witchcraft, and then, so you're a Gnostic or a cultist? You're complicating things too much, Charles. There's, this is... 
Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> if you find this stuff too complicated, my advice is ignore it. Don't study what you can't understand. And for heaven's sake, ladies and gentlemen, don't express opinions in areas that you don't catch. The problem is that if you do, you'll sound silly, and you may be actually complimenting someone. And then where would you be? But it is complex, and that's why people get so, may get so messed up on these things. They're very, very complex topics. Um, they have a certain utility, but only if you're dealing with people who are also knowledgeable about them. Again, horses for courses, preparatio evangelium. Uh, there is no point exploring the Catholic elements in Greek mythology to Hindus. If you're going to start trying to convert Hindus, you really don't have to worry about whatever is left of the primeval revelation in Greek mythology. <laughs> okay. It's not really going to help. So if you don't deal with a great many occultists and Gnostics and perennialists, I guarantee you none of this stuff is going to do you much good with one exception, and that one exception is if it leads you to accept that the sacraments and the faith are real the way this bookshelf is real. That is the one thing those people do to understand, is that the unseen, the invisible, is quite as real, in some ways almost more so, than what we can see. Reality, ladies and gentlemen, is like an iceberg. What we see, what we can experience physically, is a small part of all there is. That is a truth and a reality that the modern world has lost sight of and many Catholics have lost sight of. And of all of this gibbering that I've gone through about this stuff, helps remind you of that. Then it'll, it'll have served some purpose. What else you got? The last one uh, that we'll talk about is Crypto Hippie, which I'll, uh, I don't mind introducing because I uh, am familiar, I, I understand why you got called this. Um, this occurred uh, on a comment of a, uh, a book review of Puritan's Empire. And I believe uh, this gentleman was referring to uh, the latter half of the book where you're, you comment on the beat generation. And you say that uh, in, in different words, in much better words than uh, what I'll say, is, but that the beat generation got the diagnosis of the American society right. In that consumerism and materialism are not good things. And that the problem it, it was how they went about it. They made it even worse. But they got the diagnosis right, at least. Yeah, I, I would say that's a fair thing. I would stand by those words. Their diagnosis was spot on, but their cure was worse. <laughs> the, uh, you know, again, it's like the guy who's got arsenic poisoning, so oh, let's give him strychnine. He's sure to recover. Uh, and, and by the way, for those of you who think I'm a crypto hippie, this is a paisley tie. Just say about those of you who are old enough to remember them, you'll understand. Those of you who don't, you won't care. That's fine. Uh, and that's, I can see why the fellow would say that. Uh, but mutatis mutandis, it's like with the church after Vatican II. Uh, the rest of small, the new theology and all that, those people who were president of Vatican II, a lot of what they said about the problems of the church before Vatican II were quite correct. But the solutions were worse. Uh, in both cases, it's, it's kind of like a cancer operation that removes the healthy tissue and leaves the tumors intact and happy. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you, you end up now where we have all of the commercialism and materialism that a 50s society was capable of intact. Uh, but the, the morals, the religiosity, the the sanity that was there to some degree blasted the smithereens, to say nothing of the fashion sense. I wouldn't have gotten caught dead in a Paisley tie, incidentally, back when they were popular, just so you know. Anyway, uh, it's sadly true that American society was everything the hippies said about it. But you see, partly because the church was well, uh, let me put it this way. Just as with the Romantic Revival, 
just as at times before that. When a society realizes that it's basically on the wrong foot, the church ought to be there, and often has been, to say, you are on the wrong foot. Here's the correct path. The problem was that when we reached that point, the church was having a crisis of identity. Wow. Her leadership was as confused as anyone else. And the generation that put that confusion into practice in the church are now the leadership of the church. Just as the civil leadership today are the remnants, for the most part, of that self-same generation of 68. They were going to overthrow all that was bad and awful and dreadful with what they'd inherited and replace it with their own worthless selves. So this confluence of garbage in church and state. No, I want nothing to do with that. And if by that you wanted to find me as a hippie, well, I'm drop dead. <laughs> but if, on the other hand, and I go back to all the other terms you've used, if by any of them you mean someone who believes that the spirit does have primacy over the material, that the Catholic faith, although unseen, is literally true, and truer than anything, even truer than paying your taxes on time, that kind of truth, then I stand guilty as charged. Um, and in truth, you know, the reason why the Lord of the Rings became popular in the hippie era, or, or to get a little bit darker, H.P. Lovecraft, was because they seemed to show something beyond what we see around us. And if there's anything I've learned since that time, it is that the Catholic faith alone is true and everything else is a sham. Okay. Okay, wow, we made it through question one. We only have nine more questions to go. We're out of... <laughs> Great, let's get through them quick then. Okay. Uh, well, kind of a, a, almost a follow-up. Uh, you've also done a, a couple shows uh, with Seda Vicantis. Uh -huh. uh, so some people have, have wrote in and, and have wondered if you are a set of Vicantis as well. Are you? Nope. A set of Vicantis, especially these days, is kind of wishful thinking. Uh, How is that? Well, you would like papal infallibility to mean a pope who was always perfect. Ah. And always did the right thing, always said the right thing, always stood up for the faith, never uh, had a personal agenda, uh, never had a personal background that influenced him. In other words, a pope wasn't really human, but a sort of robot. Um, such a pope has never existed, and with all, in all likelihood, never shall. Every pope is a product of their time. We have had popes who were downright evil. We have had popes who were saints. We've had a lot who were mediocre. We've had a lot who were good at some things and awful at others. Um, Unfortunately, given the historical moment in which we, we sit now, uh, which I described, I think, to my own satisfaction anyway a minute ago, um, you would need a truly extraordinary individual to be, uh, to be Pope right now. And instead, you know, the generation of leadership we have is what they are. And you can't expect more out of them than what they are. Uh, and I don't. So, no, Saint of Accountism, uh, I, uh, I certainly do not believe him. Having said that, I do believe it's kind of uh, terrible the way Saint of Accountists often get treated. Now, I'll explain what I mean. Nobody will accuse the Saint of Accountists of not believing in the papal office. If anything, they exaggerate it. Mm -hmm. beyond what it could possibly be. But whether or not we have a pope, or who that pope may be, is a political issue, not a doctrinal one. And again, I, I hate to pull from history, in other words, from reality, to shed it on this situation. But, you remember when we had three popes, we wouldn't remember personally. Right. But the great schism. Well, St. Vincent Ferrer and St. Colette, back to any pope, 
would I be willing to say that I'm a better Catholic than they would have been had I backed the right pope? I hope not. Well, is that is that truly a, a, an accurate parallel with Senator Bacantes? Well, it may not be 100%, because no parallel is 100% in the history of the Church. There, there were never three popes until there were, and so, there haven't been since. Well, Senator Bacantes aren't picking another pope. No, they claim that the, the, the believe me, Senator Bacantes doesn't make any sense historically. Okay. I'll be the first one to tell you that. Okay. Uh, but it is a very emotional reaction to a set of real problems that people prefer to ignore. Rather than dealing with them head on, these folk are able to escape them by saying, well, he's not a real pope, so it doesn't matter. See, that's why I think your parallel is a little different, because St. Vincent Ferrer was not doing this emotional no, 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 reaction. No, 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 he was absolutely, making... okay. absolutely. As I say, it doesn't, and none of these parallels work out entirely. Yeah. I mean, when you had all but five bishops of the, of the church signing a semi-Aryan creed, yeah. and the Pope was not one of those five. Yeah. Nothing is ever precisely the same. But, I suppose what I am saying is that you do need to treat whatever, whatever Senator McCondas you know, with a modicum of the charity you'd like uh, used on you. That's true. Um, most Senator McCondas I know don't have great senses of humor. Some do, most don't. Uh, but they get a lot of abuse. There was one individual, uh, who will go nameless, who accused me of being a Satanist and all that kind of thing, and went on a real campaign about it. Should have put that on the list. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Sorry. You know, one of these days, anyway. Seriously, uh, but he accused me of all this stuff. And a lot of people who I thought would have known better jumped on the bandwagon with him. But then he turned state of a contest, and they dropped him like a hot potato. And that was a horrible thing. I'm not saying that you should, if you know state of a contest, you should endorse what they believe. I'm saying you shouldn't treat them like garbage. That's, uh, you know, firstly you're assuming that uh, you're knowing better than they do gives you the right to abuse them. I guarantee you, there are a lot of people who feel that way about you. They're knowing better than you gives them the right to abuse you. And maybe you wouldn't want to be abused. I don't know. That's true. Unless there are masochists out there. In which case, turn, turn the state of a contest, you'll get all you want. Uh, but no, it, 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 I, have, I have no, um, no use for state of a contest as a belief. But uh, I know Senator Bacantus, so I won't pretend I don't. And um, I think the way they, can, they get knocked around from time to time is, is disgraceful. To be fair, they do some knocking around themselves. Yeah. It's not one way. Oh, yeah. yeah I'll tell you, I'll tell you one, uh, some search Charles Coulomb on Google. The fifth result is by a group of Senator Bacantus, which will remain nameless. Is Charles Coulomb a Catholic? The answer I don't know. is no. <laughs> well, well, that's good to know. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's nice for them. Fortunately, I don't rely on others to self-actualize. Maybe, maybe I am a crypto hippie. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I feel like the 60s are coming over. But no, seriously, um, you know, I, I'm not saying you have to go to <laughs> take a Saturday to lunch day or something. But, again... It's wonderful if you're right. It's great. You should be. Because without the right knowledge, then you've got nothing. But you've also got to demonstrate through your charity the truth of what you hold. Unless you're a Gnostic and think the knowledge is all you need. And if that's the case, well then, I'm not a Gnostic. <laughs> Anyway, what else we got? Okay, uh, you are a monarchist who is outspoken on politics, so I think it will surprise people to know that you were involved in the machinery of the U.S. government during the 1980s. I uh, were, for a short time. Working for a congressman from New Mexico. I did. What was that like, and did you learn anything from your experience there? Yeah, uh, it was, uh, his name was Joe Skeen. I didn't work for him very long, just a couple of months in the fabulous summer of 82. 
He was a great man, brilliant man. Um, put his constituents before anything else. Uh, he had won initially through a write-in candidacy. Wow. Defeating both the, his, the Republican candidate in the primary, who had the backing of the party, and the Democrat. He was, uh, this is an English phrase, but he was a backbencher's backbencher. Okay. He was not interested in political office. He was interested in doing whatever good he could for the people of the state of Mexico. And I, uh, I'm honored to have known him as uh, you know, briefly as I did. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of our short association. Having said that, it was the summer of love, the real summer of love, not the phony one in 67, but the summer of the page scandals in Washington. Hmm. Uh, when Congressman Studs and various others were um, called on the carpet for their uh, sexual relations with male pages. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And that was when I learned that the age of consent is in the District of Columbia is 16 by Act of Congress. So, I learned enough to know that I did not want to work in Washington. Having said that, it is still my favorite city, well, not my favorite, but it's one of my favorite cities in the country. I love D.C. It's like a repository of Americana. There are the, the many institutions of various kinds, museums and libraries and Gosh, it's it's like the whole country concentrated. There are all sorts of wonderful things in the city. And I love the Capitol building, the White House. They're beautiful. It's only the creatures that inhabit them <laughs> that, uh, you know, I have problems with. It's kind of like, I think, if uh, if someone could have taken an, an architectural tour of Minas Morgul, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, if, you can, if you can get past the Nazgul and the Orcs running around, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> look at this, look at this fine, this fine stoneware. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, I... <laughs> No, I, uh, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I really can't say much more than that. <laughs> it, it, no, I, I, I mean, I, I do love Washington. Uh, I love the city. I love the layout. I love its history. Uh, it's only its president that's horrible. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so is... is is that all you'd like to say about your time at the... Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what, what can I tell you? Uh, you know, it's... it's uh, I remember uh, when I told Mr. Skeen I was going to be able to work there, he said, well, I'm going to be sorry to see you go, but I can understand why you wouldn't want to work in a bordello. And then, <laughs> you know, it... it, it uh, seriously, it was a very... It was an eye-opener. I mean... Frankly, it was like being in Hollywood. It was like being at home. The difference being that the parties I would go to, uh, instead of where it's here, everyone you'll talk to is on and on about their ends with different producers and directors. There it was their ends with different congressmen and senators wow. and, and judges. I mean, the, the fellow who came up with the phrase, Washington is Hollywood for ugly people, uh, he really, yeah. <laughs> he, he really had something there. So, I mean, I figured if I was going to go through all that drivel, I might as well come home. You know, at least here, they're pretty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, enough questions for me. Let's get to questions from your fans. Oh, boy. I'm sorry, kids. Corey Banta asks, what are your favorite Catholic films and or films you think most Catholics ought to see? Also, if these or other edifying films are not easily available, is it permissible to download or stream them from sites which are themselves legal, even if the rights to the videos have not been explicitly given over by the publishers? Wow, that's actually two questions. Yeah, two questions. Sorry. Uh, well, for starters, uh, you know, when you say Catholic films... I mean, I presume you mean films with Catholic themes. Um, 
I'm not a great fan, I guess I wasn't allowed to see them, but I'm not a great fan of things like the robe or the silver chalice or whatnot, which are religious pictures that were nevertheless uh, made by non-Catholics. I Oh, Song of Bernadette. I Ooh, like. yeah. Um, well, how about A Man for All Seasons? Yeah, both, both versions. Both versions. I actually prefer the Charlton Heston version, but I like both of them. Yeah. Um, I, there was a, film, a movie on uh, Father Damien, whose name escapes me, that I liked. Keys of the Kingdom with, um, what's his name, uh, Gregory Peck. Um, the Miracle of Our Lady of Fatima, which I saw when I was a kid. Oh. What about any, any recent ones? What about, uh, I mean, I'll, well, I'll just name some. I'll the, just name, how about For, for Greater Glory, The Cristeros? Yes. yes, For Greater Glory was good, and The Passion of the Christ. Of course. Um, I had both of those. Um, the um, how about how about some ones that are kind of video only? Do you watch any anything that comes out from Ignatius Press? Maybe uh, like Padre Pio. No. Um, oh, don't. how about the one? How about Saint Joseph Cupertino uh, with uh, Ricardo Montalban as the bad guy? I don't know you know, I never saw that. I've I've heard of it. I've never seen it's it. It's a good. Yeah, I like that one. And I. I um, that, you know, the, the truth of the matter is is that uh, the kinds of films I grew up watching were not primarily religious. Religion we got at home, and uh, Lord knows we were taught it, but the films we saw, we saw a lot of Disney. Uh, really? Yeah, especially the live action things. Kidnapped, uh, yeah. I was very, very fond of. Of course, the major hero is Catholic in that one. Uh, Zorro, uh, great oh, yeah. fans of. In Search of the Castaways. Where uh, one of the one of the heroes is a is a priest played by Marie Chevalier, uh, one of my favorite actors to this day. Uh, you know the the a lot of medieval films I love the the uh, uh, the Black Arrow, uh, things like that. The Prisoner of Zenda. Uh, one of one of uh, these all had as I'm as I'm talking to you, I realize they actually all had Catholic themes, but they weren't the major point of the plot. Mm -hmm. They were alongside, they were part of it. Yeah. So, for instance, in Prisoner of Zenda, uh, and I'm talking about the 1936 Ronald Coleman version. You know, both the coronation and the wedding to the, uh, the queen are done in stately Catholic ceremonial and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, it, it, they were not, uh, Catholicism was part of the decor, as you might say, but it wasn't the major point of these films. Yeah. Um, so, so it sounds like, you know, you don't get Catholicism from the film. So, in other words, you're not making a recommendation that you ought to see these films, but they're good films. They're good films, yeah. I mean, uh, they're not. Uh, they're certainly not what you would call uh, catechism films. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but for instance, uh, taking Kidnapped as an example, the hero is. Uh, a leader of the 45 rebellion, who uh, the the uh, well, no, he's not the hero. I mean, the the, the protagonist is uh, a kid who's raised Presbyterian and uh, encounters this wild, gallant papist. Of course, he was brought up all his life to think papists were terrible and that supporters of the Stuarts were terrible. And of course, in the end, it's one of precisely one of those that saves the day for him. Uh, yeah. And the character of Alan Breck Stewart is uh, one of my favorites in all literature. Hmm. And, okay. and uh, uh, David Finch played him in the movie and did a, a brilliant job, or Peter Finch, rather, did a brilliant, brilliant job in uh, Disney's Kidnapped. Okay. Uh, well, what about the, the second question, uh, the legal question? <sighs> well, I don't know. It depends. What... Um, what do you have that you make your living at that you don't mind being done for free? It's true. I, um, I mean, it's it's. There is, of course, the fact that it's that in the immediate, it's only major corporations that are being hurt. But the problem is that those major corporations do pay people. You're right. And uh, if they collapse, which you know they're so badly run, they don't need a lot of pushing. Uh, a lot of people will be out of work and so on. You know, it's, it's, I would definitely talk to my confessor if it's a big deal for you. Mm -hmm. 
but you know, the the uh, I know how much I enjoy seeing my work uh, running around the internet for free, um, which happens constantly. Not that I'm complaining, but you know, my work is as much uh, evangelistic as it is to make a living, so it's not quite the same thing. Okay. Um. Okay, question by a person with the alias Sam I Am Now. Uh, she asks, or he asks, um, what would be the top resources to give someone uh, who isn't Catholic but is open to looking at a book or talk? Well, uh, to be honest with you, it depends on the person. I mean, you've got to figure out what they're interested in. Uh, but one of the things I very often give out, first and foremost, is G.K. Chesterton's book, Orthodoxy. Oh, okay. Uh, the reason for that is that he portrays the faith as it is, exciting and enchanting. Um, you see, and this goes, brings us back to the original question about occultism and all that, it's important to realize that Catholicism is a religion of wonder. And if you can get people to see that, to see that it's so much more than the humdrum nonsense of everyday life, the devil wants us to look at the church purely in terms of rules and regulations, which it most certainly has, and which we all need to follow. I'm not saying we don't. But that's the best way to chase people away, is to lead with that. If it weren't, Orthodox Judaism would really be picking up converts right, left, and center. <laughs> but orthodoxy is as good an introduction to the Catholic worldview as I've ever found in English. Wow. So I like to leave with that. Now, Lord of the Rings is a good thing also. Uh, usually people will have read it. But when you point out how influenced by Catholicism it is and what a Catholic work its author believed it to be, that helps. And then, of course, uh, you know, there are all sorts of good uh, evangelistic tools out right now, uh, which you could move on to beforehand. But the first thing is to get it through their heads that Catholicism is something wondrous and exciting and something they really need to be part of if their lives aren't going to be dull and pointless. Okay. Not that dull and pointless lives are bad. Okay. Uh Jay asks, have you ever considered writing fiction, uh, books, movies, television, etc.? And what are your favorite TV shows? All right. Well, the answer is yes. Well, which I, one? Uh, For books, movie, or television? A, a novel. Actually, uh, one novel and a, and a kid's novel, neither of which are complete. I've been sitting on my computer for some time. A kid's novel? Uh -huh. I can't picture that. Well, and you may never. <laughs> 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 Nevertheless, there they sit. Uh, my, I approached my agent uh, with them at one point, and he said, well, I'll tell you the truth, I can teach you how to write a novel that will sell in the quasi-movie script the language they like now. But you would not enjoy the lessons, and even if you succeeded in learning how to do it, I can't promise you I could sell them. Ah, uh, okay. So that was enough to discourage me from, uh, from fiction. But you never know. Never know. Uh, the second question... TV shows. Ah, TV shows. Well, my favorite TV shows, I must be honest with you, are the ones I grew up with. So, uh, Perry Mason, Bewitched, Green Acres. Um, I have a very pedestrian taste in TV shows. The Twilight Zone. One Step Beyond, The Adams Family. And, yeah, the weird stuff was pretty big back then. Uh, and comedy. You know, I, I love the old, the old pre uh, All in the Family sitcoms because the rule for them was uh, a weird individual or people in the normal setting or normal people and individual in a weird setting. That was the rule of thumb for sitcoms. And that was, the, that was the basis of that kind of humor. And I still find it hysterical, although modern sitcoms are more interested in dirty jokes than they are in... You don't like All in the Family? 
Uh, not really. I mean, all the family was hailed at the time by introducing realism into comedy. Okay, if I wanted realism, I wouldn't be watching comedy. Mm -hmm. okay. I get realism all the time. Realism is this fellow who just emailed me saying that his wife's sister hung herself and oh, his no. wife found her. That's realism. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Realism is my brother's two best friends just dying over the past two months. That's realism. If I wanted that, I don't need it for television. I don't need that on TV. I got all the realism I can stomach mm. in the real world. Okay. No, 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 no. When I want to be entertained, I don't want to be thinking about that. I'm going to be entertained. I know it's a lot to ask. So what happened was that after all of the family, my tastes changed somewhat in the sense that I became more interested in crime shows. Or detective shows, I should say. Well, that's like Perry Mason? Well, Perry Mason, of course, was the beginning of it. But boy, did we have so many others. We had Magnum P.I. We had Murder, She Wrote. Wow. We had Simon and Simon. Uh, golly, we had a ton of these guys. The, the silver age of broadcasting in the 80s. Um, you, you say you don't like realism. Uh, did you watch uh, Star the original Star Trek? Oh, gosh, yes. Absolutely. bloody <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. That was glued and dark shadows. Okay. Man, oh, man, oh, man of Shevitz. I, uh, the <laughs> the uh, uh, Lost in Space. Uh, boy. Now, and you could say, well, gee, that's all escapist. And your tastes tend to run toward escapism. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Because, like, I know all about the real stuff. It's as Gerard Tolkien said. It's easy to debunk escapism. But notice the people who do so are usually the jailers. Okay. And, I mean, you know, what can I tell you? When I was growing up, church and state were collapsing. We were having race riots. Um... I got to watch everything I loved in church and state continually stepped on by those in charge. Yeah, 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 escapism, I get it, sure. Okay, makes sense. Maybe not. Maybe I, I should like to have the same stuff shoved in front of my face on all the family. By the way, I loved Carol O'Connor as an actor. And he was also a decent human being. Just a little while. Okay. I loved his restaurant, too, The Ginger Man. Great place. He used to, he used to play the music instrument there on Saturday nights. Wow. In, in, in L.A.? Yeah. Well, Beverly Hills. Well, yeah, Beverly Hills. Yeah, I think it was Beverly Hills. See, that's what comes, ladies and gentlemen, from being raised out here. They're not just behind the TV screen. They're real people with lives of their own. Okay. Uh, Stefan has two questions for you. Uh, his first question, do you consider yourself loyal to any living princely pretender, in parentheses, other than the Pope? Uh, who? Uh, my personal perplexity gives some context for the question. I revere the intelligent, educated Prince John... Uh, Jean de Orleans, but it makes, but it, but does it make any sense for an American citizen living in Yonkers, born under the jurisdiction of, of Elizabeth the Second, to bind himself to the House of Orleans? Should I renew my former loyalty to the Windsors, who are both Protestant and usurpers? Should I be loyal to a Jacobite heir, uh, Duke Franz, who, as far as I know, does not claim the Jacobite succession? Very, very good question. Uh, well, for myself, I have a, a tremendous affection, affection for the House of Habsburg, uh, not least because they are the bearers of the Western imperial tradition. I have a tremendous affection for the House of Bourbon, both the, uh, not the Orléans, I'm sorry to say, oh. but the legitimists, uh, the Duc d'Anjou, Louis the Twentieth. Although, what he says about, uh, about uh, the Duc d'Orléans is quite true. He's all those things. And certainly better than any president Francis had since de Gaulle. 
But um, um, similarly, I've got a certain affection for the Spanish bourbons, or at least the Carlists, uh, partly ideological, partly because I live in California, which they founded. Uh, and certainly I've got a lot of affection for the Jacobite heirs. But his question is a very, very good one. Uh, especially, I mean, anybody living in the Yonkers has problems just by living in the Yonkers. Um, oh. You didn't need to hear that, and I didn't need to say it. Uh, a good friend of mine once complained. I was born in Manhattan, just so you know. A good friend of mine from Syracuse once complained when I said something about upstate, which he considered demeaning, and he said, You know, people in the city, huh, it's all upstate to you. It doesn't matter if it's Lake Champlain or Yonkers. Well, you know what? You guys are low down. So don't, uh, don't take any uh, amusement I have at Yonkers' uh, expense, seriously. Uh, and actually, it's got a very noble name because it comes from Yonkier, which is a Dutch noble title, just in a while. It was owned by one originally. That's why it's called Yonkers. It was the Yonkiers. Anyway, uh, but to answer your question more suitably, those are personal interests. In terms of the country as a whole, you've touched upon a big difficulty for the American monarchist, and that is that there is no single uh, dynasty, a single monarchical tradition that encompasses the whole country. Uh, I'll take you a step further. You could have a certain loyalty to the Queen of the Netherlands, or the King of the Netherlands now, uh, given that New York was founded by the Dutch. You see, or if you were uh, ethnic Russian or Iranian or Ethiopian, you have an ancestral monarch you could be attached to. But there is no single monarchical tradition for the whole nation. That is the problem I tackle in my book, Star Spangled Crown. Oh, I'm sorry, was that a plug? Oh, oh, you always used to see this on the talk shows when I was a kid. They'd always, oh, I'm sorry, was that a plug? No, it wasn't a plug. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> anyway. Uh, no, in Star Spangled Crown, I, I examine this very issue uh, because while the history of this country uh, prior to 1776, north of Florida and east of the Mississippi, uh, and as late as 1914 in the U.S. Virgin Islands, while well, our history is monarchical in its origins, there is not a single monarchical story that encompasses us all. And so the story of the book is the attempt of a latter Jacobite heir to construct one, not quite from whole cloth, but pulling in bits and pieces from here and there to try to create one, which, however, is not dissimilar to what the Founding Fathers did in the first place when they cooked up the Republic. And I do mean they cooked it up. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, there was no, there were, there were, they had nothing to... They took a little bit from here, a little bit from there, because they had no precedence, really, no complete mode to fit into. That's why all of our lesser governmental offices from the state level down all have royal origins. Because it was a, a mix and match, uh, cut and paste kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And that, in truth, is what the case would be for any American monarchy. So rather than a question of loyalty to a particular dynasty, Although, you know, we can always hope that uh, once the claims pass to the Liechtensteins, so they'll, they'll become more conscious of it. Uh, Josef Enzel for King of the United States. <laughs> the, uh, the, he's a little kid now, but you just wait. Uh, but we can become ever more uh, aware of the monarchical origins of our own country, our own land, certainly of Yonkers. And I'm not being funny. The Yonkers, I mean, the, the, the uh, uh, Manorio families that lived there in the, were enormous, the Phillipses in particular. We can become much, much more aware of that than we are, number one. Number two, we can begin to develop a patriotism, a love of these United States that is not tied simply to the ideology of 1776 or 1789 and not merely to its institutions. We can begin to develop within ourselves a patriotism for the country itself, whose roots are definitely monarchical, 
and we can begin to think about the institution as it might or might not one day eventuate here. Uh, and then as far as personal loyalties based upon one's own family or one's own history, well, you know, that's, that's a matter of personal interest. But that's, you know, that's the thing. Um, in my own case, I mean, because of my mixed descent, that gives me interest in about three or four different dynasties. I'm sure the same is true for most of us. Uh, but focus on the institution and on these United States above and beyond the Republican interlude. <laughs> Okay, uh, Stefan's second question, what projects in the writing of American history would you recommend to a budding revisionist Catholic historian? Quite a few. Uh, for starters, the uh, Jacobites, the, the, the Stuarts and the Jacobites in pre-revolutionary history and their effect on, Amer on American colonial history up to and including the revolution. That's one area. Uh, the Loyalists, of course, could always take more exposure and more interest. The uh, defenders of, of the Spanish crown in the Southwest prior to 1821, because, you know, that was when they were fighting the Wars of Independence, and they had an effect here uh, in California and Texas and all that. The, uh, certainly the, the French and Spanish colonial uh, heritage in this country, as much of it survives. Um, the war between the states, now the role of Catholics in the war between the states is rarely explored, either north or south, and we can do with a lot more of that. Uh, the interconnection between Reconstruction and Jim Crow is another thing that could use more, uh, more work. The fact that uh, Confederate generals like Beauregard and uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, at least the ones that were still around, opposed the rise of Jim Crow, most of them, most of the first rank. That kind of thing needs to be looked into. Uh, the role of ethnic Catholics in attempting to implant the uh, social teachings of the church in this country uh, should be looked into. I'm thinking of things like the Mexican American Sinarchistas, the uh, German Central Verein in St. Louis, the Sunnanel amongst the French Canadians in New England. These are all things that need to be looked at. Uh, the, the whole, as one book put it, the formation of a Catholic counterculture, uh, which was the case up until Vatican II, that all needs to be looked at. So, I mean, uh, a great Catholic evangelists from Father De Smet to Father Damon, Arnold Damon, Father Michael Merler, uh, Father Thayer in uh, 18th century New England. All of these figures need to be dusted off and looked at again. Okay, uh, Chris Bates asks... Ralph Adams Cram. There's another one you need to look at. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Chris Bates asks, uh, what catechisms would you recommend and the proverbial desert island question? What are the books you take with you to the same? Okay, well, uh, for your short catechisms, the John Neumann Catechism, composed by, say, John Neumann. <laughs> Oddly enough, hence the name. Yeah. Uh, for large catechisms, the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of Trent, although it has a few uh, errors in it, one of which was notably pointed out by Pope Pius XII, uh, for the most part, uh, where it goes astray is when it relies on itself, and most of it is simply the rulings of Trent on this or that question. And where it does go astray is precisely where it varies or, or tries to go beyond what Trent said. Okay. Uh, oh, and as, as for the, the Desert Island question, the book's point. Well, Lord of the Rings. Um, the Douay Bible, and Dom Guéranger's, and this is cheating, 
But Dom Granger is liturgical year. Yeah, because that's like 50 bucks. Right. Well, <laughs> no, 14, know. but who's counting? 14. <laughs> uh, but Lord of the Rings is three, so or four counting The Hobbit. So, you know, okay. well, I've already cheated once. <laughs> Might as well let me in the door. Yeah. But with those three, I think I could probably uh, maintain. Those are, yeah, those are some good picks. Um, oh, wow. Okay, we finally reached our final question. Oh, boy. Excellent. Uh, several people have asked about your dad. He's uh, still dead. Thanks for asking. Oh, well. They want to know uh, what was his background, profession, opinions, and personality. He sounds like a devout Catholic man and a good father. Uh, what kind of man was he? Oh, that's true. What kind of man was my father? Well. My dad was quite simply the greatest man I ever met, and I've met more than a few. He was born in uh, 1926 in uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, in uh, part of what, for want of a better word, you'd have to call a French ghetto. But his parents were not um, lower class people, shall we say. His dad was an actor and a writer, and uh, they had two homes in in uh, New York and in New Bedford, and when the season would open up in uh, in uh, New York, they would uh, the theatrical season and all that. They would take the uh, the Fall River Line, first class. You always remember Lennon and uh, Sterling Silver. Nobody travels like that anymore uh, to New York. But he was very very proud of being French. French was his first language. Uh, though he, and he had, uh, his education was at parochial schools in New Bedford, half the day in English, half the day in French. So he was perfectly bilingual. Um, he, uh, as I say, he was very proud of being French, he was very devout. Uh, he was named, his name was funny, his name was Guy Coulomb, and Guy is not a family name. We have a lot of family names in my family. Charles and Joseph, mm -hmm. uh, Andre, Alexis. We have, you see the same names over and over and over again. But Guy was very strange, was very peculiar. And he was named after an individual who was very popular in those days in Catholic circles, but it's almost unheard of today. A little kid called Guy de Fongalon, who died, I think, when he was eight years old, and was the youngest non martyr ever to be proposed for canonization. Uh, his cause was pretty much shut down in 1948. I don't know why, but it oh, was. Okay. But nevertheless, he was very popular at the time my father was born. And my grandparents, being very devout, uh, loved Guy de Fongelon and hoped that uh, their, uh, their son would uh, follow in his footsteps. His older sister, uh, they named Fleurette, which means little flower. And that reflects the devotion they also had to St. Therese, uh, which my father had. Uh, his favorite saints were Our Lady and St. Therese and St. Joseph. Uh, he um, was very much of a thinker, though. His, uh, he came around in the immediate aftermath of the Sentinelle controversy, in which the, uh, the good chunk of the French-Canadian population of New England were pitted against their Irish bishop. And it almost came to a schism though not quite, and it was papered over, but the memory my dad very much had in mind. And so when decades later, the clergy seemed to go crazy. Uh, we just sort of laughed and said, yeah, well, they've, they've been there before. <laughs> so it didn't, it didn't shake his faith, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, as it did for so many people, you know, the father's pouring cereal on his head, the faith must be a lie. Right. Well, no. Uh, my dad... Uh, always had a, um, he lacked that worship of the clergy that led so many people astray, both in Quebec and down here. Um, he always wanted to be an actor. And he went, he went to World War II. His mother did not want him to go. His family was very much America first. Uh, he was born in 26, as I was saying. So, uh, when he turned 17, 
he asked her to, to let him volunteer, and she refused because she didn't want him fighting Mr. Roosevelt's war. <laughs> but uh, when he turned 18, and of course he was her only son, oh. so he didn't have to go. But um, he volunteered on his 18th birthday. And they sent him off to the Pacific, and he was a tail gunner uh, against the Japanese. 13 successful missions. Wow. When the average lifespan of a uh, tail gunner in combat was uh, seconds. Wow. So he always used to say that other people may say they believe in God. I know. So anyway, he came back from the war and he, uh, he went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts uh, on the GI plan. He came out here briefly in 1948 and decided he didn't like the movies and went back and he went to radio, which had always been his great love. Uh, he was on a number of shows and it was on a radio stage, the uh, 1951, the Lux Theater of the Air that he met my mother. And she was the first woman to break into radio in 15 years because she could do five voices in one broadcast. Wow. Yeah, that meant they only had to pay one lady for five roles. <laughs> Trust me, it, it, it. <laughs> they, they weren't wowing. They weren't like, wow, she's so talented. They were, wow, so much money we saved. <laughs> that, that was their wow. But at any rate, uh, so he uh, realized for various reasons uh, in the mid-60s that uh, acting wasn't going to cut it in terms of uh, New York, so he came out to L.A. and lost his money, sadly, but never let it get him down. And that was the thing about my father. You know, he, the worst, the, the kinds of misfortunes that would destroy other men, he laughed at. And that was the thing about Dad. He could always find the humor in any situation, no matter how awful it seemed. Uh, and his great line was, in 10 years, we'll be laughing at all of this. You couldn't impress him, you couldn't intimidate him, you couldn't shift him. But he was always a general, never threw his weight around. He used to say that uh, the ideal is the male fist in the velvet glove. And that if you're truly powerful, you don't have to show it. You don't have to impress anyone. But he also used to say, you know, never, never, uh, never, um, uh, justify yourself. Let the other man justify himself. Who is he asking you these questions anyway? Let him go. Yeah, that was the way. That was the way he was. Uh, very well read. Uh, I can honestly say that every single one of my intellectual interests, my father started me on. Wow. Uh, true. He had a very wide-ranging mind. Uh, his military connection he kept up in the New York State Guard and then out here in the. California State Military Reserve. Is, is he, so he, is he why you're a monarchist? No. Uh, well, yes, no, no, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, no in the sense that he was not a monarchist per se. He was very proud of this country and its institutions. Yes, in that his affections for the House of Stuart and the House of Bourbon, uh, certainly, plus my mother's for the House of Habsburg, uh, really destroyed any kind of prejudice against monarchy that I might have. I see. Uh, and while he was pro-American, it didn't make him anti-English. You know, he would point out, for instance, to the Declaration of Independence, the Quebec Act, which is what gave our, our people their freedom of religion and language and so on, is denounced in the most Orwellian terms. But that knowledge didn't turn him off on the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was the thing about my father. His knowing something did not turn him on or off about much of anything. If you understand what I'm saying. In other words, how to put this another way. He knew the way the vast majority of people don't, that the revolution was not all about freedom and liberty. Mm. But it didn't, it did not uh, reduce his love of his country one little bit. 
You see what I mean? No, I, I absolutely see what you mean. He could hold these things in stasis because forget the revolution. This is the country his grandfather came to that is done very, very well by us. And so we have an obligation to it. It's not uh, some weird pie in the sky, uh, spirit of 76 drill. Mm -hmm. This is the country that also, from all time, God saw fit to put us in. Uh, and that, we have an obligation to evangelize and to improve for its sake. Yeah. The faith doesn't need America. America needs the faith. And if we truly love America as we pretend we do, remember the big mouth and yeah. little, little brain stem, rather than simply saying it's wonderful, we'll do our best to make it so. Um, so I can tell you he was a real patriot. Yeah. He did not think its institutions were the best ever devised or that uh, it's the last hope of, last best hope of mankind or the shining city on the hill. Well, it's the country that our fathers came to and the country that our ancestors uh, built even before it was a country and that has done really well by us. So his patriotism was was uh, based in reality. Mm -hmm. He loved history. He loved every not just American history, which he adored. You know, he uh, uh, he uh, was a uh, avid subscriber to American Heritage magazine. Yeah, whose whose uh, reappearance I am very happy for. Uh, but uh, there there were so many things he was interested in. Yeah, the thing with my dad was not what is he interested in; it's what is he not interested in. Mm. He was really a universal man that way, and that he had an ending sense of curiosity and an unending sense of fun, mm -hmm. and that was the thing about my dad. In with all these other qualities, he was a lot of fun. He was a great joker. He had been around, and he was still an idealist. You know, there's the old joke, uh, what's a cynic? Was well, a romantic who's been mugged? Well, <laughs> my dad had equivalently been mugged many, many a time, but it did not embitter him or make him a cynic at all. Quite the contrary. Yeah. So, what kind of a man was my father? I go back to what I started with, the greatest man I ever knew. And if I could be a tenth the man he was before I die, then I'll have done something. Okay. I hope that answers your question as to what kind of a man Dad was. He, uh, it is something of a consolation to know that uh, I'll be planted right by him when I croak in Notre Dame Cemetery, Fall River, Massachusetts. So if you ever get the chance, ladies and gentlemen, you're in Fall River, drop by. Don't tell him I sent you, he'll already know. <laughs> wow. But honestly, ladies and gentlemen, uh, also I, I do have to say about Dad that he had a great sympathy for the underdog. You know, even if he didn't think the underdog was right, he had a tremendous sympathy for it. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if he saw somebody getting beaten up, even if he knew it was the guy's own stupid fault, it didn't stop him from uh, wading in. Uh, and he had that great facility, which I wish more Catholics today had, of suspended judgment. In other words, he didn't simply jump to conclusions and say it's this or it's that. He'd look at it and say, well, okay. Yeah. These are the facts as far as I know them, but he could let it sit there. He, uh, he used to say that the vast majority of opinion, uh, of people in, in, in uh, opinion polls lie. Mm -hmm. The truth of the matter is that they don't know or don't care. If, if these polls were absolutely honest, would be the majority in every case. <laughs> and he was the one who told me, you know, don't feel you have to have an opinion on everything. Yeah. If you don't care about something, <laughs> you don't care about it. Yeah. Uh, and that takes, especially in our society, it's become so politicized, 
And so, uh, what's the word I want? So divided. Yeah. So polarized. That's the word. It does take a certain amount of, of courage to say, mm -hmm. you know what, I don't know. I don't have an opinion. I don't care, even. It does take a certain amount of courage to say that. And it takes, and this again, you taught me, it takes a certain amount of courage to say, well, no, it's not all that way. Mm -hmm. You see, in a society polarized such as ours, you're supposed to line up on this and or on that. These guys are all right, these guys are all wrong, and that's the end of it. It's impossible for us to see that, well, you know, our side has a certain amount of wrong on it, and their side has a certain amount of right. Right. Now, that doesn't mean the certain amount of right they've got doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely in the right. Mm -hmm. But we have to bear it in mind. You see? And I will say, and I'll end off my, my talking about Dad, though it's a subject I could go on and on about, right. frankly. Well, I mean... No, I mean, uh, rightfully so. Rightfully I, I, so. I, 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 I wish I, I would have met your dad. It would have been... I would have loved to have met him. Well, your, your brother did. Yeah. So, there you go. See, that's what comes to being older. Yeah. But, uh, oh, did we need to say that, really? Anyway. Dad, uh... Dad had that facility of being able to value things that were not necessarily of value to him. And I remember uh, reading, uh, oh gosh, was he reading? Colonel Churchward's books on the lost continent of Mo. And I asked him, I said, do you really believe all that, Dad? Yeah. And he says, oh gosh, no, but isn't it fascinating? That was my father all over. Yeah. No, no, not, not at all, but isn't it fascinating? Yeah. So anyway, there you go. There's my dad. Okay. That's it for this episode. If you enjoyed listening to Charles, please subscribe to the Tumblr House YouTube channel. If you'd like to send Charles a question, you can do, through, uh, do so through YouTube comments or contact us through the Tumblr House website. See you next time. And if you're not good, then get you.